right. Let's go ahead and get started for the evening. I'll talk very slow, just in case there are some of you still getting, you know, your snackies and getting your blankie ready. Uh, my name is Jean from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I will be your virtual host this evening. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science is pleased, as always, to partner with the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management to present Indigenous film and bring Indigenous voices and filmmakers into our museum programming. We always love this. As you watch the presentation tonight, please put your questions and comments in the chat. We'll be watching the chat throughout the event and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, for those of you who are watching the PowerPoint, I, as I was saying, we've got four incredible films. We've got some of the filmmakers here tonight. So please don't hesitate, put your questions and comments in the chat and we'll make sure that they can address them. So to begin tonight's event, I would like to introduce the one, the only, Jean Rubin, the director of, Indigenous, of the Indigenous Film and Arts Festival. Jean, Go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Welcome everyone uh, to another program in our 2023 monthly Indigenous film series. I'm Jean Rubin. I direct um, the Indigenous Film and Arts Festival, our annual event, as well as uh, programming these, these um, monthly films. With me is Merv Tano. He's president of the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management. Clearly, uh, one of the presenting organizations, along with uh, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science uh, and the Denver American Indian Commission. So we have some wonderful co-sponsors for this series. Uh, the museum has been hosting an our annual festival events for 13 years and has been hosting this Indigenous film series for eight years. So uh, long-standing relationship, and uh, it was because of um, all of their efforts that we were able to uh, transition uh, to having a combination of in theater and virtual programs. So our thanks to everybody that you see on camera, as well as the people uh, behind the scenes. Uh, we also want to thank the Denver American Indian Commission, uh, one of the presenting partners, and our 2023 media sponsor, Kubo Jazz Radio. Tonight's program is quintessentially Indigenous. If you've been joining our programs for a while, you know when we have uh, shorts programs, we generally um, have an overarching theme. The first film that I saw of the four you're going to see tonight is called The Interview. And in a nutshell, it's an interview that was conducted as a film class assignment. And when I saw it, I said, this is so wonderful. We have to screen this film. And I was really struggling to figure out what's the theme going to be. I mean, interviewing was going to not be a theme. Um, and filmmaking was, you know, interviewing was so narrow, we couldn't use that. And filmmaking is so broad, it's essentially everything that we put up on the screen. So while I was still pondering, I uh, put it up for Murph to preview. And when the film was over, his comment was, this is so indigenous. <laughs> and I said, oh, there's our theme. We'll look for films that we consider to be just quintessentially indigenous, films that would only come from indigenous filmmakers. And we have four films that fit the bill, and I think you're going to love them. We love them. Uh, the first one in our lineup is called Svani versus the Swedish Tax Agency, uh, from filmmaker Maria Fredriksson. Maria is Swedish of Sami descent. We were hoping she could join us, and she was hoping she could join us, but when we looked at uh, the, the time zones, it's 3 a.m. where she is, and so that wasn't going to be possible. But she did um, leave me a few comments to share with the audience uh, about uh, the making of her film. She was, uh, she's of Sami descent, but she was raised in what she calls a 100% Swedish environment. And she wanted to get, uh, kind of strengthen her connections with her Sami ancestry for herself and particular, became particularly important after she had two kids because she wanted them to appreciate her ancestry, their ancestry. Uh, she was researching a film about her grandmother who was a well-known Sami author. And in the process, she met uh, the family that you see in this film, 
And the mother in the film actually looked to Marie's grandmother as a role model. So she made that personal connection and that's, that's how she came to make this film. Um, the next film in our lineup is called Hi, My Name is Liliana from Liliana Rice. Um, third is Longhouse from filmmaker Eric Sanchez. Uh, hey, Eric. Uh, we'll, bring the, we'll bring him on uh, with a, an introduction and, and to be part of our conversation after the films. And the third is The Interview from Diana Harper. Diana. Gonna give us a wave. Um, so the total runtime for the the four films is fifteen minutes. We'll run them all back to back, and then we'll come back for conversation. So let's roll. <laughs> I love these films. I could just I could just put these on a continuous loop and keep watching these films. However, I also love to hear from the filmmakers. So let me introduce the folks. Um, I will do this in the order that we saw the film. So Eric uh, Sanchez is a member of the Shoalwater Bay Indian Tribe, uh, a recent graduate from the Institute of American Indian Arts, uh, majoring in cinematic arts, graduated in December. Um, Ayana Harper was born in France to Trinidadian parents. She would describe herself as Euro Trini, fully embracing both cultures. Uh, she's now based in Toronto, Canada, currently an editor for the CBC, but says in her free time, pursues her passion of direction and editing short films. Uh, the award-winning short, The Interview, was her directorial debut. So thank you both for joining us, love your films. And so glad you can be here to, to chat with us. Uh, I have a question for both of you. I, if you could just talk about your, your path to filmmaking, how you decided you wanted to be a filmmaker, what that path was like, and where you are today on that journey. Who wants to jump in and go first? Shall we do ladies first, International sure. Women's Day and all? Even though it's international, international women's <laughs> yeah. um, So I first, I would say I first got into filmmaking uh, in high school, uh, kind of randomly. I had a French teacher that decided that she wanted to have a like film festival. And so we had to make these short films in French about, um, it was about the environment. And once we got to the editing, stage I just felt like wow I love the moment where you actually get to put all of this together and it becomes a film and I found that I had a knack for it and so kind of from there I went to university I did communications then I did a master's in film and I specialized in in editing um then I took some time off and then I got back into it and moving to uh, to Canada. And yeah, so now I'm, I'm editing at the CBC. And so that's kind of been my, my trajectory and working on, you know, passion projects, et cetera, along the way. Yeah, so you had, very cool. Uh, let me do a quick follow up with Diana. You know, a lot of filmmakers that I've talked to say they can't edit their own films. Is that, was that more challenging to edit your own? It's definitely more challenging. And I think I actually, the, la the last short film that I directed, I think this is the first time I've run into that issue where I was just too close to everything and it would have been better to actually give someone else a, a chance to do it. Before that, I think I didn't think that it was so difficult, but this time around, I, I completely understand why you should actually have an editor that is not you. Thank you. Eric, tell us about your journey. Um, I think it started with uh, my uncle leaving his camcorder on the table and me stealing it from him. Uh, I think I was, I don't know, 11. And I had uh, these action figures that I do stop motion with his camcorder to make them move. And then I just always stuck with telling stories. I got really good at lying and uh, 
people would always be like, why are you always lying? But I was just really practicing my storytelling. And uh, it runs in the family. Uh, way back when I come from the a line of storytellers. So it's just in the blood. Yeah. Um, I went to school for photography in Seattle. And I had a teacher who told me, uh, you know, you might as well get into something else because no one wants to look at photos anymore. So that kind of broke my heart. Uh, so then I was like, well, I guess I got to learn how to make these pictures move now. And I went to the Institute of American Indian Arts for the cinematics and fell in love with uh, comedy and making comedic shorts. And that's that's where I'm at. Graduated and now I'm trying to figure out where to go next, grad school or just start making more shorts. I don't know. You know, I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about the importance of the longhouse and also your your whole creative process where I love that at the end of the the, cer the ceremony lifts the longhouse into the sky. Could you talk about that a bit? Yeah, yeah. So uh yeah, I'm I'm Chinookin. So we uh we we do the longhouse for our for our winter homes and um Oh, you know, it's multi-generational as well. We got the whole family. We got uh, even the, like your wife or your husband's family. It's a, it's everybody living with us. So um, I, I have always wanted to do something where it looks Pacific Northwest Indian. Uh, so I picked a longhouse, but the story, the whole thing came to me uh, at my first sweat lodge I was sweating in Puyallup here in Washington and uh, it was on my 28th birthday, 29th birthday. And I'd never done a sweat before. So I, I went in and right when they closed that door, I felt like we were moving. And I was like, whoa, did I, uh, where did I go? And I felt like maybe I went to a different, you know, layer or somewhere or next level. So that's where that thought came from. I was just thinking about that. And I was like, oh, I'll just make it take off and into the universe. It's lovely. It's just, it's really beautiful to watch. Yeah, I love that. That longhouse took forever to draw out. Yeah. So what was the, what, what was the process you used for the animation? Was that actually a series of hand drawings? No, that's all, uh, I trace photographs from one of our longhouses um, in Adobe Illustrator. And then I moved it to After Effects to make it all move around. Can you say a, a little bit about the, because uh, you know you mentioned that it's intergenerational in, in the long house, uh, and and for me the the, the long house. Uh, Let me back up a bit. <clears throat> I've uh, had uh, lots of heated arguments with uh, folks who are uh, building homes. They want to do it in a sustainable way. They want to do it with, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, so that it is uh, somehow going to be adaptive as, as we deal with climate. And my point, and, and a lot of them are, you know, they, they, they like a certain kind of building material. Right? And my argument was always, you, you, that's, that's not the, uh, the way of in, indigenous. The material is, in a sense, uh, less important than what the house means to its inhabitants. Uh, that there are uh, certain values, certain principles that are embedded in the design of a house. Uh, and when you look at a longhouse, you see that it is a communal thing. It is not a standalone uh, house where each family has its own uh, uh, kind of place of residence. 
<laughs> and so that means something about family attitudes, I mean, attitudes about family. Can you explain a little bit about what some of those attitudes are and how the, if you will, the, the rules of the house? Uh, what are the rules of the house? Yeah, I wish I knew, but uh, I grew up in America and they put me in this like modern day house. <laughs> I just know uh, there's a certain direction you walk in the long house. Um, I know with our long houses, they were able to um, be able to take it apart, put on a canoe and go up river or down river. Um, Cause we weren't staying in one place. That wasn't our thing. We had to you know, it's cold over here. Let's go down south. Um, I think that's one of the best things I learned about the longhouse is it wasn't like, you know, what people think today is land ownership or owning a home is, you know, when you buy a house, you're stuck there. But the longhouse is like, well, let's just take it down and move it around. Um, but I don't really know that much about like rules of the longhouse. Um, I would have to learn more. I want to learn more. We had a we had a program looking at indigenous architecture, and uh, Daniel Glenn, who's a, a Crow architect, has done some really uh, amazing buildings. And what's it, it, what's critical to his um, his architecture is the the process with the community to figure out what it is the community wants. And there's a lot of communication. Um, and he, he built some housing um, that kind of, that, that was pulling in the longhouse concept into, you know, modern, modern living. Uh, he was saying, you know, people, they're, they, they want their private space, you know, they've been accustomed to having their own private space, but the, um, it's, it's, it's housing units, it's two, it's two long rows that face each other and it's all connected that everyone has their, their individual space, uh, but very reminiscent visually of a longhouse, and then as part of that is communal space. So it's uh, it's you know it's bringing that so, some of the, the the concepts of and the form and the function um, into into modern housing. It's it's quite a nice project. Yeah, I I, I wish there's more longhouses. Um, I know definitely I want to bring one here on the reservation. Um, it's all in the future and planning and and uh, making our voice heard. It's like, hey, you know, we had this thing going on way back when. Let's let's put another one up. So we have one more uh, longhouse question uh, from our audience. Uh, says, I loved that they entered the longhouse through the belly, through the body. Would you talk about the significance of this? Uh, I think it was just more of a. Uh, technical thing I was trying out in in the program after effects because I drew the whole thing and uh I was our teacher I oh I should probably say I made this for my animation one class so this was my final project our teacher taught us about like you know how to move cameras how to set anchors so I just moved the camera in and I thought it looked pretty cool so that, that's what I did but there, there was no significance. It just, uh, actually, I guess there is because uh, we have kind of cool looking doors. They're, they are that kind of oval egg shape uh, openings. And I was like, oh, that'd be cool if I could just bring all of us into the inside of this long house. So I'm glad I got to learn how to, how to move the camera. Good. Ayana. I have a question for you, and you know what my question is because I asked you already. Asked you. <laughs> I don't know the answer, but you know the question. Uh, I was curious whether you were documenting an actual process that you went through, or whether this was all just spinning a story because to make the film. And we have a post in the in the chat which is very connected. So let me read this as well. She says, Ayana, was anyone coached or is this typical, oh, is this typical family dynamics? It could have been my family interactions. 
Yeah, it's funny because um, I, when when we were talking about this too, I was saying that, you know, one of the things that I love is that it has managed to resonate with so many people. But I suppose the way to explain how this short came about is that in the summer I was taking a class online, a documentary class online at New York Film Academy. And um, we had to do a two part documentary. And in fact, I shot something else. And then the day before I had to hand it in, I realized that my footage had no sound. One of my cameras like had stopped shooting in, in the middle of uh, my interview. And so I ended up with 24 hours to come up with an assignment. And then I thought like, why don't I just document that? But I, it's kind of, it's the situation is real but it is sort of mockumentary in the sense that I, the first day I did tell these people like, tell me no, but the opening, for example, with my sister telling me that she's not available for the month, like she came up with that on the fly. And I thought it was just absolutely hilarious. So that's why I opened the film that way. And with my dad, um, I tried to coach him, but he wouldn't listen. So that was also, uh, you know, I would just sort of be like, talk to me about, and he would just do his own thing, um, which worked out perfectly because I couldn't have come up with the gems that he did. Uh, the only person who was really coached was my mom about like, come in, you know, try to come in or do this or that kind of thing. But uh, it was kind of, yeah, I think it was just organic and not at the same time. I think I managed to like hit that, uh, that know pretty well. I'll tell you what, one of the things that, that just tickled both of us, <laughs> well, we, we call your dad the, the universal <laughs> indigenous grandfather. We, uh, Merv uh, had been general counsel be before he uh, started our institute. He was general counsel at the Council of Energy Resource Tribes. And one of the uh, internship programs at the, at the end of the summer, they had a, a camp out and there were all of these native kids, you know, what, high school, were they college or high school? High school, high school seniors. Going into college. Sitting around on logs, sitting around a, a campfire, and there was a tribal elder who started telling stories. And everybody was just held, you know, in just rapt attention. And he started wandering <laughs> from tribal stories to talking about the renovations he was doing at his house. <laughs> and he started going on about, you know, some of the difficulties about renovating a house, which was a real different thing than what all these kids were expecting. But nobody, I'd, I was, part of my, my mind was listening to him and part of my mind was just watching all these kids. Nobody fidgeted, nobody, you know, got, did we have cell phones back then? I'm not sure, but nobody got anything, you know, to do on their lap. Everybody just gave him their full attention. And it spoke so much to us about the, the respect that, that Native kids are brought up with, is respect for elders. Um, and so we kind of like the, the meandering from one topic to the next because as we know, as we get older, that's what older folks tend to do. <laughs> but it was done. It was perfect. It was perfect. Have you thought about acting in addition to editing and directing? Because you're actually pretty fantastic in that movie. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you know, why not, right? Like it, it would be it would be cool to to act in something that I'm not directing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm glad that it, uh, that even that it came across as being real that, you know, it was like, uh, especially the part where it's sort of just me on camera. I'm, uh, you know, I'm glad that, that, that works, but I think, yeah, the true success of that short is my dad, but it really is like his entire essence on film. It, it just, that is who he is. So I think that that's, that's also why it worked. Yeah. Your mom's funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, coming in or the camera falls over. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So uh so we have some more uh questions from the audience. Um for Ayana, is your family home intergenerational? 
and how do you uh how do your how does your family express their their feeling of being part of your story oh um so well my family it's my home isn't intergenerational that's so that's my dad um so it's just, it's just like yeah the kids and, and my parents um but i think actually they my dad really liked being in the in the short it was also that was shot during the pandemic um and one thing that i've been lucky with that i think a lot of artists don't have the the same kind of help is their parents like my parents were are very supportive of the fact that i want to be a filmmaker etc so whenever they're able to help they would so i think that uh, my dad also really enjoyed the fact that people liked it and like i think we got a we it was a nice bonding experience for the both of us because you know then he obviously acted and then once he saw the whole thing he was like yeah this is actually hilarious and it's kind of funny also to see yourself oh. um, on screen you don't really know how you, how you come across and stuff so i think it was it was a good experience for us both Oh, wait, there's another question about your family. <laughs> Did your mom want to be interviewed also? She is <laughs> um, No, I think I think my mom was fine um, just being <laughs> in and out of, of uh, the short. She played a very integral part to the story. Um, and also it's like, it, it, again, it was very much who she is. She's like kind of meek and that kind of stuff. And sometimes, you know, a little bit. <laughs> so I, so it, it worked out. <laughs> so Eric, did, uh, did you get um, feedback from your family about your piece? That was that your first, that's your first animation. Was it your first film? Yeah, that's my first animation. Uh, it's probably like my fourth film when I started school. Uh, let's see. My nieces love it. They think it's super cool. I think it inspired my nephew to start playing around with uh, After Effects. Um, so I think it made a positive effect in my in in my family. That's cool. Actually, I have a question for you. Do you do you um, is animation your preferred medium or? do you prefer like just doing yeah more classical yeah um it, animation is intense and uh i like where what you could do with it and um i really like that thing about jumping on the computer oh like editing like you jump on the computer and like hours go by and it's like well all right i was in the zone um I don't, I, I'll stick with it. I, I like playing with it, but I still really like, uh, you know, just non-animation films. Uh, I like working with actors and um, I think I, I do that a little bit more on the fly and easier than animation. Yeah, animation is its own beast. Yeah, I, I, I definitely learned, you know, the patience it takes. Yeah, you learn patience, and uh, I definitely have way, way, way more respect for animators. Yeah, absolutely. Gina and I were talking about that with uh, uh, animation uh, because in the uh, uh, whose film is it? Oh, Liliana. Liliana. She said she always wanted to be an animator. You know, I'm going to be 80 years old uh, uh, the end of this month, and so for me, animation is the old. Uh, uh mickey mouse donald duck kind of thing and uh it was only through television and uh, uh the, the disney uh i forget what the the name of the program was that you you got a sense of how animators work all of those cells hundreds and hundreds of cells to to get something like a not thousands, uh, like a uh, uh, Snow White. So that's that's kind of my where I start from, and I I, I see what's what's happening now with with the technology. Uh, 
And, and the, the, the question I have uh, is, Do, do you all, as part of your training, kind of uh, get back to some of the old style, or is it just the what past is past and uh, nothing to learn from that, and just go with the with the the newer technology? Yeah, at my school they had the history of animation, uh, where they just you know showed all that there is and the new stuff. I only took animation one. So I'm kind of stuck at just making things go like this. <laughs> um, there is animation too, where you get into 3D art. Um, but yeah, I think our school is more getting to like uh, the newest technology. Um, we just got one of those motion capture systems and uh, the other animator students, they're just loving it. I don't know how to do that, but there's going to be a lot of good stuff coming out of IAIA for animation pretty soon. Uh, and then, well, I would say for me, we don't really work on film that much. So you, I don't even know how I would edit something that was shot on, on film. And they don't teach it, I think, because the technology is expensive now. Uh, so everything is digital. But mm -hmm. one thing that I can think of is we do like look at the history of, so I, I was at Humber, which is a school here, and we did do sort of like the history of editing because one of the things with editing is that it is like sort of the language of the film. It's where you create the film. And there have been changes in the way that you deal with that language. So one of the things that I think it was um, Hitchcock's uh, Dial M for Murder, and it's that moment where he's on the phone and the wife is being uh, attacked and they kept cutting back and forth all the time because at the time like the language of film wasn't that the audience would be able to know that these things are going on at the same time so you had to keep telling them this is happening and this is happening and this is happening which if you look to stuff now that's just not the way because we're so accustomed to seeing uh, visual media that the language changed once you see the phone and you see a cut to something else you would still understand that they're on the phone while this is happening you know so that that kind of thing we are taught about because it's integral to understanding film as an entire um, genre but I think more like the more technical stuff that's old school yeah that that I didn't really do myself One of the things that's interesting to me is how some stories just seem to lend themselves to one one particular genre or another. You know, with with your film, Ayanna, there's there's so much conveyed with body language and, and your facial ex expressions are just are priceless. You're not going to get that with animation. I mean, you can make you know you can make an animated you can you can put facial expressions, but you you don't capture it the same. You know, it's not the same as as you making that rolling the eyes and and for eric i mean how how do you make a longhouse fly if it's not animation so it seems as though there's some stories where the 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 medium and the 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 content just line up so perfectly yeah, uh, oh we have more questions uh ayana do you plan to make any more films with your family um yeah i mean i'm i'm always open to filming with my family filming with my friends as long as nobody's camera shy you know why not <laughs> and um yeah it's actually it's it's fun to shoot with with your family especially because they believe in you so you know they're gonna they're gonna bring their a game every time which is also really nice and and it influences the kinds of stories you can tell as well i mean this the interview is my family um which is not something that i may have been able to recreate the same way if i had cast it you know so so there is there is that aspect that is great with working with your family or working with your friends because you know these people so intimately and they know you that you can get things out of them you can 
you know, do stuff that you probably wouldn't be able to do with um, with actors in the same way. And you know what? What could have been a disaster turned out to be a problem, right? I mean, with the, the the all the camera problems you had with with the the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I I just uh, uh, viewed. Uh, uh, Le, Le Demoiselle uh, de, de Rochefort. Uh, are you familiar with that film, Jacques Demy? No. Okay. Oh, it's a, it's a uh, it's a tribute to the American musical, but it is uh, it is quintessentially Gallic. It is French. I mean, you it's. They got Gene Kelly there, uh, you know, a uh, great American dancer. They had George Shakiris, who was a, a dancer in uh, uh, an uh, Oscar award winning uh, actor in West Side Story. They were part of it, uh, but you could see, you could feel that it was different. Okay. And uh, when I, uh, uh, viewed uh, Taika Waititi's uh, uh, Thor. So, you know, that was a, a Marvel, an MCU kind of a thing, but it was also quintessentially indigenous to me. I mean, you could, you could feel the, the, the Maori, the Polynesian, the Indian just throbbing over there. Uh, are, are, are there films uh, that you, you see now uh, uh, or films that you would think of making, uh, creating yourself, that have that kind of vibe that say, okay, you know, we, we're going to do uh, a musical, but it's going to be indigenous. We're going to do sci-fi, but it's going to be indigenous. And, and how does that, what's, what's the process by which that, that takes place? Yeah, I feel like I always have ideas about, hey, let's do this movie, but let's just put a bunch of natives in it this time. Um, you know, I am a firm believer of like, you know, I'm, I'm a filmmaker, whatever I make, uh, because I am native. Uh, you know, people are going to be like, oh, that's a native film. But uh, I love, you know, telling our stories. I, this is who I am. And what was that quote from uh, that one guy that everything's kind of autobiographical? So, you know, I, I think uh, all my friends that I went to school with and everyone that is a native filmmaker that I'm meeting, there's just so much potential and it's there's just so much that we're going to do and I'm so excited for it. And, you know, I, I really love watching short films. They're so fun. Right, and, right, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's, a re, it's a real art to, to make an impactful short film because, you're, you know, it's such a condensed time, time frame you have. But, man, when they're good, they're great. Ayanna, do you want to weigh in on Merv's? Yeah, I mean, just in the sense that I think being Black, I think about like representation and just the fact that there may not be uh, enough representation of Blackness uh, in film that's like positive. And when I think about making films, I just think that we all experience so many things that are relatable. It just happens to be that I'm black, that you're native, that someone else is white, but in a lot of ways, our stories are very interconnected. And so I think I do want to make more stories, obviously that involve like black people, but maybe don't center necessarily around something that is black because there is no such thing in reality. And it's just, we're all, we all have the same kind of experiences and I would want anybody to be able to look uh, at my films and relate. 
we hit a home run as far as our family is concerned. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good thing that it resonates and resonates with so many people on so many different levels too, you know, because, um, I, I think that, yeah, everybody has, uh, all these intergenerational connections and so you do see those moments where you're like okay these two generations are meeting and so there's something that's that's happening that that only happens when you have someone that's considerably older than you if you have to deal with technology or you know any of those kinds of things so um yeah i think it's it's just about making films that are true to me but also re like relatable to to others Uh, one of the things that I, th I thought was interesting uh, about the, uh, uh, what was the name of the tax? Uh, oh, Svani versus the Swedish right. tax agency. I, I, I view that as a, another kind of quintessential uh, indigenous issue where when, when, you, when, you, when you live as a, as a native person, in this larger society, they have no idea. They have no idea who you are, what a tribe is, what, what the family is, uh, about the status of, in, in the case of here in the United States, uh, treaties and treaty rights. And they say, well, you know, what? why are you spearfishing? <laughs> we can't spearfish. Why do you have these special rights uh, or, why are you showing me this this Mickey Mouse uh, driver's license? You know, you're from South Dakota or you're from Washington State. This is from, you know, <laughs> an Indian tribe. Had, had, had you had experiences like that in your life? Not necessarily documented, but uh, through your life experience, just just see this disconnect between who you are, what a tribe is, and uh, officialdom. Uh, for me, I feel like sometimes I have to be uh, uh, the tour guide for, uh, you know, Americans, Europeans, because they're all, they're all, they all want to know, right? Oh, hey, I thought you guys were all dead, but now, now we're here. Um, I recently moved to Chicago and, uh, I got stopped in a restaurant by, by this guy. Like, Are you native American? I'm like, I am. And he's like, I never met one before. I'm like, really? You know, there's, there's a bunch of, uh, native guys cooking your food right now. You know, they say they're Mexicans, but you know, this is who we are. Um, yeah. Tribal IDs. Hey, I just got my new tribal ID right now, earlier today. They look good, man. They came out, they're nice. So I'm really excited to start showing it off more. Like, um, but yeah, you know, they they want state IDs. They want something with knowledge that they know, you know, I don't know, it's, a, it's weird. So what do you have, uh, either one of you have a, a project in the works? Something we can look forward to seeing? Um, yeah, I'm finishing up um, a short that I directed. We're in the final stages of post-production, it took forever. Um, it's also a short film. And so hopefully that will be by like, the end of this month, I'm hoping, end of this month, beginning of next month, um, I should have uh, another short film that will be making the festival circuit. Yeah. You know, what's that one called? That oh. one is called In Due Time. Cool. Yeah. I can say a lot. It's, it's about, um, it's about a couple deciding whether they want to have a child or not, considering the state of the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, I'm working on, I have two, two films I finished before finishing school. Mm -hmm. Right now I'm pushing uh, 
Oh, it's a, it's a mockumentary. It's oh, called, yeah, it's, nice. it's, it's called nice. Fry Bread Jesus. Okay. Um, it's about a, a native guy cooking up fry bread, and uh, uh, he finds the image of Jesus Christ on his fry bread. So uh, the news, you know, station comes down and interviews them and all that stuff. That one's going through the festival circuit. And then um, come summertime, I'll start submitting my senior project. It's called Tai Yi, Messenger of the Void. Um, that story is the hero's journey. Uh, native guy has to move back to the reservation after the death of his father and he He's next in line to become, you know, a leader, but he don't want to do that. You know, he don't want to be a, you know, a chief or what or anything. He just wants to party still. So that's a coming of age story. And other than those two, I'm always uh, working on things with my partner. They're an actor, performance artist, and we're we're just making fun stuff. We're we're funny people, so we're working on what we got. Is it possible to watch um, your films or are they still at the moment like in the festival circuit and, and not online? Uh, other than Fry Bread Jesus and Tai Yi, I do got some stuff on my YouTube. Okay. I forgot. I should have put that in the link. Uh, yeah, don't worry. Yeah, I'll, I'll send it. It's not too late. Type it in. Yeah, let me find that. Let me find that page. Yeah. yeah. Well, Keep us in mind, both of you, when you when you start submitting to festivals, because yeah. not only would we love to see it, I know we've got an audience here that would love to see it. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that your dad uh, was part of a, a musical group. Yeah, he actually was. Um, he, uh, I think, what it was like some of his friends, and they used to play uh, guitar when he was younger, and like I think that they were relatively popular in Trinidad. And he sort of just mentions it like casually. And so that that's why I asked it, but he's a very good guitarist. Um, so that's why I had him talk about it in the, in the film. Yeah, I was wondering if that would uh, uh, <laughs> be a, a great story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's true. I never I never really considered that. And I mean, honestly, everything that he mentioned in like, I mean, he he collects stamps and he has an ex yeah, I saw that. Yeah. extensive stamp collection. And I think when we were younger, he did try to get my sister and I interested and we weren't having any of it. But, you know, now you get older and you can appreciate the things that your parents are into and that kind of stuff and be like, actually, you know, yeah, explain this to me. Why should I be interested in stamps? <laughs> So uh, in, in Trinidad, uh, uh, did you have, uh, pardon my ignorance, but uh, you had French citizenship? No, so I have French citizenship because I was born in France. Um, born in France. Yeah, so, so yeah, so I'm, I, grew up in 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 France and in Belgium mainly but my parents are Trinidadian and the last before moving to Canada I was in Trinidad I moved to Trinidad at, at 25 um I because I wanted to sort of well I suppose really it was that I felt that I I always felt Trinidadian but I I hadn't lived there so there is something to be said about living in the place that you're from that gives you a, a kind of insight into you know who you are even um that you don't have or can't appreciate in the same way when you live outside of your country. Um, so after I finished my master's, I moved to Trinidad also because I wanted to sort of see what the film landscape was there, you know, what, what kinds of films people were making, that kind of thing. And uh, so then I, I was there up until the pandemic. Hmm. Yeah. Hey, I feel like- How many times did you live? Um, I'm Parisian, so in Paris. Yeah. I feel like we were on the same path because I ended up uh, back on the reservation at 25. Yeah. I remember telling my aunt, hey, auntie, I know how to be Mexican, but I don't know if I really know how to be Indian. So uh, she told me, uh, well, let's go get in the car and drive me to the pot shop and I'll teach you all about it. <laughs> <laughs> 
so so for both of you how, how have you how have you brought your those 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 cultures into your life currently i know for a lot of people it's through food sometimes yeah. it's through music but how how are you uh how are you staying connected to those roots i think that that it is like food and and music um and then I mean, I I was I, what I liked about being in Trinidad and moving there was that I met people my age and was able to have friends that were Trinidadian because there's also that and even just understanding what it's like to you know be young in a in a different place that kind of thing. I mean, it it's it centers you because you are. Um, able to see yourself. That was one of the things that I, I think was good for me in going back to Trinidad is that of course, half the population is black. Um, most people are, if, if not black, it's of, of Indian descent. So everyone is brown, let's say. And um, I actually, when I, when I moved, a friend of mine from high school came with me. We kind of did this Caribbean like tour and so she she came to Trinidad with me and I remember one of the things she kept saying was like oh my god Ayanna everybody here is brown everybody everybody's and you know it was just like yeah that's true I all of a sudden everybody looked like me there's actually a lot of Ayanas in Trinidad too like it's a pretty common name in in Trinidad and particularly of of uh women my age group so like even those kinds of things you feel like all the similarities all the commonalities that you weren't potentially able to find outside like even something as simple as my hair you know it wasn't as nobody thought anything about the fact that I have locks in in Trinidad whereas in other places it's definitely something that can be a little contentious that kind of thing um so yeah I mean and I'm sure uh, Eric you've had like the same thing is that it 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 kind of answers a lot of questions to you about yourself yeah it's like um when I came back home uh, and found out and asked the questions, but like, who, who are, what was our family? You learned the blueprint to your, uh, who you are, the blueprint to your life when you figure out what, what your ancestors were doing and being on your land is just so important because, uh, I feel like I, I walk with my ancestors when I'm here. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're, we're coming up to the end of our time. I'll give our 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 audience a a last call for questions. If anybody, I think someone asked when the last time I was in Trinidad was. But you kind of you kind of yeah yeah it was, was right gone. right at the at the start of the pandemic yeah. Oh, so you were there during the pandemic? No, so um, that's a whole story in and of itself, but. I had actually gone to DC to visit my parents and then uh, Trinidad closed the border. So I haven't been back to Trinidad since then, but I also wasn't really actually trying to leave. So, so yeah, so a lot of things, but yeah, the last time I was there was January of 2020. Well, thank you both so much. I appreciate you taking the time, sharing your films with us and, and taking the time to, to chat. We really appreciate it. Can I have one oh, more you question? Can I have another question? Uh, in in the, your classes, was there any discussion of uh, artificial intelligence and its, and its use uh, in the uh, creative process? Yeah, I, I was taking a dome class um, and we were learning about like spherical filmmaking. And uh, one day we had, uh, we had just some guy show up and show us some uh, AI generators. Um, there was nothing we were doing. He just kind of showed us the, the new tool of it. That's as much AI we got. What's the sphericals? Is that when they have like the cam, the, the projections of the background yeah, yeah exactly. oh my gosh i know we, yeah. we talked about that too isn't it's crazy yeah that class is was so much fun i love that class yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that stuff is that i think that's as close as we got to uh some of the ai stuff as well but i mean even um with like dropped frames and stuff when you're editing there's now a lot of the software can just kind of 
figure out what would have been in the gap. So it, it it's yeah. it's everywhere. Sometimes yeah. you can't even see it, but um, but yeah. Yeah, that kind of anticipation, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I remember being impressed when I would take a, a picture with a slow camera and I was off kilter and the Photoshop would, would tilt tip it for me. I thought that was, <laughs> that was technology, but I guess that was a few years ago. Huh? Yeah. Oh my gosh. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes, this has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much, everyone. Gene and Merv, any, any last words? I mean, Eric, Ayana, if you have any last words, now's the time. Oh, yeah, I'm just real happy to be here. Thank you for having me over. Uh, it was really nice meeting you and watching your film. Yeah, same. Uh, it's always nice to meet um, other filmmakers. And like you said, I love shorts, too. So I, I, I love watching other people's shorts and, and see what people can create in such a short amount of time. Great. Well, thank you to our hosts. Thank you to our guests. Thank you to our audience. Yes, thank you all. Thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, they, I mean, really, everybody, thank you. Panelists, Jean, Merv, thank you very much for joining us. Our audience, you all are wonderful. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. Uh, just a heads up that April and May are both going to be virtual, so you can hang out with me, same time, same place. Uh, and if you enjoyed tonight's program and would like to support the Indigenous Film Series, I'm going to put that link for our virtual donation bucket into the chat, as well as Ayana and Eric's link once again. Let me press send on that one all right and that will do it for the night i'm going to throw that powerpoint back up take your time looking through the chats and hopefully we will see you in april and may thank you everybody <laughs>